Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman. That's pharmacy, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, a place for conversations that matter. And today's conversation really matters because our guest is Paul Hawken, one of the leading environmentalists and who's going to help us learn about climate change, not from the bad point of view of how it sucks and it's all going to kill us, but how to fix it, which is something that people really don't talk about. And he's got the street cred to prove it. He's uh, started out in Boston in 1966 with the first natural foods store where they had whole grains in bulk and seeds, where they had cold pressed oils, the first place ever, sold vegetables. It was the first kind of whole foods in a way. And uh, you went on to do much bigger work as an environmentalist, as an entrepreneur, as an author, an activist, and you've dedicated your life to environmental sustainability and changing the relationship between business and the environment. And your books have been profound in that in that way, and I'm going to talk about them in a minute. But you're one of the environmental movement's leading voices. You're a pioneering architect of corporate reform with respect to ecological practices. Your work includes founding successful, ecologically conscious businesses, writing about the impacts of commerce on living systems, and consulting with heads of state and CEOs on economic development industrial ecology, whatever that is, we'll talk about that, and environmental policy. And Paul is now the executive director of one of the most extraordinary projects that's going on today in the face of our climate crisis. It's called Project Drawdown. It's a nonprofit. It's dedicated to researching when and how global warming can be reversed, not just stopped, but actually reversed. The organization maps and models the scaling of 100 substantive technological social and ecological solutions to global warming. These are things that actually exist right now that people are doing that can be scaled. Not to mention all the new innovative things that can also happen in the coming years. Now, Paul writes articles, op-eds, peer-reviewed papers. He's written seven books, including four bestsellers, The Next Economy, Growing a Business, The Ecology of Commerce, and Blessed Unrest. The Ecology of Commerce was voted the number one college tech on business and environment by professors in 67 business schools. That is no small feat. And his book, Natural Capitalism, Creating the Next Industrial Revolution, co-authored with Amory Lovins, another environmentalist, has been read and referred to by several of heads of state, including President Bill Clinton, who called it one of the five most important books in the world today. That is quite a pedigree, Paul. Thank you for joining us today in the Doctor's Pharmacy. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So what uh, struck me was the first time I heard you speak uh, at an event, uh, you laid out a vision of climate that was very different than any I'd ever heard before. It was a vision that was hopeful as opposed to depressing and made you want to run hide under a table, which is what we mostly hear, that storms and floods and heating up of the planet and people dying and ice caps melting and polar bears dying. I mean, this is where we mostly reside when it comes to that. And then, of course, we have climate deniers and we have climate activists and it's all a big mess and you crystallize it into this extraordinary story narrative which was that hey we can do something about this not only can we slow global warming and climate change but that we can actually reverse it what you call draw down carbon in the environment mm -hmm. that is a big statement and it's something that most of us have a hard time grappling with and yet these hundred solutions you mapped out were were pretty profound in their ability to to be implemented and literally save trillions and trillions of dollars and sequester giga and gigatons. I don't even know what's bigger than a gigaton, but many gigatons <laughs> of carbon out of the environment, which is not how we normally think of it. So how did this idea come about? And what inspired you to bring together a hundred of the top scientists and researchers in the world to call out these solutions and make them practical? It came about, I think, for the same reason that you just uh, referred to, which is that <clears throat> primarily what people hear about is the probability of what's going, going to go wrong, how it is going wrong, how fast it's going wrong sooner than we thought it was going to go wrong. Yeah. And the it's about impact. It's about impact that's happening today more and more, but it's also about the impact that's going to happen. And that is the mandate of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN-sponsored agent, you know, uh, really collaboration. And that was a new report they just released. It's just even released, worse than we thought. It's 30 years old today. It started in 1988. The sixth assessment comes out, and just last week the 1.5C sort of report came out, uh, which is if we don't reach, again, very cautionary, very sort of apocalyptic, if we don't hit one, if we go over 1.5C, we're in big trouble and we have very little chance of hitting it. That was sort of the report. And it really continued to repeat a pattern of 
climate communication, which emphasizes gloom, threat, doom, fear, yeah. and lights up the amygdala, so to speak, and uh, fight or flight. But it, it makes people disempowered. Yeah, That's the most important thing about it. Not that the science isn't valid. The, va- the science is good. Yeah, but it's kind of like you being a doctor. What if you know diagnosis is not prognosis? You know that, right? First, you have to do diagnosis. So IPCC does a really good job on diagnosis, but it conflates everything else with prognosis, right? And that is where people get basically not only disempowered but numb, turn away. They'll deny it because this is really about life and death. And so it's not surprising a lot of people say, screw you, it's not true, I don't believe it, blah, 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 you know, because the science is so hard to basically take in. It's it very is. hard to take in. It is. And from my point of view... I, mean, every- I, I, I saw Al Gore speak at a conference recently and he showed a slide, a picture of an octopus in a parking lot in Miami. Mm. because mm-hmm. the water levels have risen and now we see yeah. fish and seafood in the parking lots. I mean, I it's... Know. Well, just imagine somebody comes to, you, comes to you, you're diagnosed and they have four-stage cancer of some organ. Okay, they come to you and you say, hey, you know, John, you're, you have four-stage cancer. And then, and that's it. And then John tells all his friends and they say, John, you know, I heard you saw Dr. Hyman, you have four-stage cancer, you know, liver, got liver cancer. He said, yeah. And every week and day, they keep telling him, he has cancer, he has cancer. And then after a month, you see John say, God, it's been a month. It's probably, you know, worse, worse because <laughs> it's mitosis. That's what cancer likes to do. Yeah. Likes to, and John's never going to get better. You know, I mean, if he's third stage, second stage, he's never going to get better because everything he hears mm-hmm. is about how sick he is. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much what was happening with climate. And I was watching it for years and years, and I, you know, realized that every problem, every problem without exception, is a solution in disguise. Yeah. In disguise. And the job of a doctor is to say, hey, this is the solution. Yeah. The problem is symptomatic, right? Yeah. Of a cause. This is the solution to the cause, yeah. right? So that's true with every problem we have. And it's certainly true with climate change because it is the most super wicked, gnarly problem ever, you know, surfaced in the history of civilization. Yeah. And therefore, Within it is this plethora of transformative solutions mm. that make this a far better place and world for everyone than the one we live in now. Yeah, so you know the Chinese word for crisis mm. is two characters: opportunity and danger. Yes. So embedded within every crisis, like the climate crisis or health crisis, yeah, are these issues. And the the thing that struck me about this is when most of us think of climate, we think of coal burning, we think of cars, we think of you know, energy use, we think of all these things that are really about solving it through the energy sector, right? Mm. Wind, solar, nuclear, whatever. The thing that struck me was that the food system as a whole is the biggest solution when you aggregate all the solutions. And we're gonna go into each of these solutions during this podcast, so I want you to stay tuned. But it is stunning how many things are actually already being done that have been proven scientifically, because you didn't look at anything that was a hope. You looked at things that were actually measurable, where there was data, where actually they could be implemented at scale, and they could save enormous amounts of money with little investment and actually sequester enormous amounts of carbon. So the food sector is huge. How did that sort of Come well, about that you when we started had that this, insight because you didn't you didn't come in with a set of predisposed ideas. You just we did looked at the ideas. Actually, we did. You I did. think everybody has them, and okay. the same predisposed ideas you just spoke of, which is well, you're going to solve the problem. It's going to be solar and wind, right? And Elon, the energy and that was, was the Elon Musk, right? right, right. right. Say, <laughs> before we he, be driving a Prius or a Tesla, before right? he smoked a joint on Joe Rogan's show. But <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the point being is that we all thought of energy. As and it makes logical sense because two thirds of the greenhouse gas emissions are caused by the combustion of coal, gas, and oil. So, duh. But actually, how you get back from where you came from is not the way you go. Mm. That is to say, you can't just replace energy sources and solve the problem. Mm-hmm. They're crucial solutions. So, because that's only putting less into the environment. It's exactly. not actually it's not drawing down the car. Not at all. It's not reversal at all. Yeah. It's just slowing down. It's kind of like we're going to a cliff. You say, look, everybody slow down. I say, oh, great, we're slowing down. Where are you going? Over the cliff. You're just right. going slower. 
and right. and that's essentially that's what, what we talk about chronic disease management not reversal of chronic disease yeah. which is what i'm all about we call it Thelma and louise solutions yeah yeah <laughs> which is like it doesn't make any difference you're going the wrong way mm. you know and so, so even you when you came into this you thought oh it's the energy sector that's where the solution oh my gosh from. yeah i mean when we went into it all of us it was all five of us but we had a hundred you know over 200 actually other people but we all had our bias we all n knew kind of what the top five or ten were we could have written them down we were all wrong mm -hmm. and what was interesting about that is that we kind of knew we were wrong we didn't know what the top ones would be around Paris around three years ago and the conference of the parties the Paris agreement was created at that time in December 15 and I realized then that you had 30,000 people going to Paris who were climate experts scientists activists politicians government leaders etc and not one single person could have written down the top five or ten solutions not in order yeah. To reversing global warming. Right. And isn't that astonishing, anthropologically speaking, yeah. that here we are. 30,000 experts and they weren't looking at the, the right question. The greatest problem civilization has ever faced and nobody knows what the solutions are. And it occurred to me once I was in Seattle and I was giving a talk and I noticed several times that to my right were these young lads, 14, 15 years old, you know. So it's great that they were there. But when I said that, I turned to them and said, how old are you? And I said, oh, I'm 14, oh, I'm 15. I said, can you name the top five NBA, <laughs> a, NBA teams? And they said, sure. Boom, no, boom, 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 right, boom. No problem. And I thought, okay. And <laughs> nobody in the world can name the five top solutions. So we did map, measure, and model them. We had a methodology that forfended and prohibited bias mm -hmm. uh, because there was 200 of us. And so our bias was fine. You could park it. But the method didn't allow it. It had to be peer-reviewed science, had to be multiple scientific reports on that solution, had to be scaling, had to be robust economic data from the IEA or the World Bank, FAO, Bloomberg Energy, IPCC. Yeah. So the data in Drawdown that we amassed actually isn't our data. We were actually holding a mirror it. up to the world yeah. saying, this is what we're doing, this is what we know, and this is what it costs, this is how much we would save. And what we did do is continue to scale scaling solutions they're already scaling yeah until 2050 at a rigorous but reasonable rate to see if in fact we could achieve that point in the future where greenhouse gases peak and go down on a year-to-year -year basis that's drawdown that's what drawdown and means. that you think if these solutions were implemented at scale would be 2050 oh well we sooner. did it just we just scaled them and then we started to tweak them say well let's just accelerate this one a little more and do this a little you know and so forth and we can do it 2045 we can do it 2040. Mm -hmm. i mean it, we can do it even sooner it's it's interesting but what we did is just took the scaling rates that were there rather than sort of imposing or projecting upon them and when we hit the total button because you can't model a solution by itself Nothing exists by itself. And every solution interacts with, dynamically with so many other, other sectors things, of right. society, you know? Yeah. I mean, food being probably the most complex in that mm -hmm. sense. And so two months before the book came out, April 17th, we had laid it out, we designed it, we had the plates, not the publisher, and we waited the last moment to put in the numbers because you're never done with a model. Mm -hmm. Every single model is wrong. Mm. And every so often you can make a model that's useful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we try to make one that is useful. useful yeah. It's about the future. Nobody knows the future, so we waited right until the end because the model gets better and better and yeah. better, you know. And we hit the total button in February 2017, and we were shocked. We were so surprised. We're going, how big a change? Oh my could gosh! Happen. Oh yeah, where it's like this. Who, Would we, we get down to pre-industrial times, or how how far back can we get? In what sense? Well, if we implement all these hundred solutions. Well, what I was what I'm trying to say is that when we hit the total button, eight of the top twenty were food related. Yeah, food. That's related. what I want to get back to. Food yeah. related, like who knew? Right. Exactly. That was a shock to me. I mean, I always knew that climate change was an issue, right? You hear about factory farming of animals and yeah. methane and and the release of carbon dioxide, the way we farm. You hear about the use of energy through the fertilizers we use, the pesticides we use. We're all petrochemical, right. transporting food. So it's one fifth of all of our fossil fuels are used to uh, fuel animal production and and also agricultural production. Yeah. So that's a that's a lot, twenty percent. But 
you know, I didn't think it was such a big solution. Like you said, it was a big aha for me, and I've been in this business for a while. So I was sort of shocked to hear that. And what, what you're saying is that the food sector isn't necessarily the biggest contributor to climate change, although it is. It's the second biggest, right, after energy? After transport. Transportation, mm. which is a lot of energy, right? Cars. Cars, yeah. <laughs> Buses, ships, yeah. planes. So that, that's pretty yeah. big. Yeah. Number two. Yeah. And and yet it's the number one solution right. to climate change, which you know, is... Because it's a twofer. Yeah. It does two things. One is when you change agricultural practices and move away from CAFOs, confined area feeding, uh, feeding operations for ruminants um, and pigs, um, you not only reduce and avoid emissions, you stop putting greenhouse gases up there, yeah. but you can actually sequester them Right. Back. And, you know, in regenerative agriculture, you know, food forests and goes on and on, you know, stable waste, tropical tree right. crops, I mean, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So no other sector can really do that is yeah. stop emitting and pull it back home. Because all the carbon that's up there that's uh, in question in the sense that it's greater than the approximately 280 ppm yeah. that was there up and down during the Holocene period for the last 10,000 years. Uh, that carbon, the extra carbon, which is now CO2 at 409 ppm, um, we put it up there. Yeah. And so really, drawdown is about, can we bring it back home? Yeah. Because it actually is ancient sunlight. That's what coal, gas, and oil is. It's yeah. ancient it's sunlight. True. It's ancient photosynthesis. It's true. And it's photosynthesis right. that can actually bring it back home and store it in the yeah. soil yeah. for centuries and thousands of years. So I want to break the conversation down a bit. There's there's the big picture. What are the top sectors? And I just want to briefly go over those so people put it in context. Then I want to talk about the food sector in the sense of how is our food system contributing to climate change? What are those big things that are happening that we're doing in our food system that are making it worse? And then let's go through the solutions. So I'm going to try to walk you through it. But let's start with from the big picture. You know, what um, What are the top sectors that, that we're focused on in this book drawdown that you're going to sort of explain that, that are big drivers of, of... Well, food's number one. And in, interestingly, transport is number two in causally. That is to say, in terms of emissions, it was last in terms of a sector. You say, well, how could that So we be? don't need to all drive a Prius, you mean? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it, it, even if you go to EVs and electric and plug-ins and so forth, the fact is that we use, remember, outs, we use other people's data. Yeah. So we use the projections of the World Bank and the IEA as to what the economy would be like in the next 32 years. We didn't use our projections. We use yeah. these esteemed international organizations. And they project that vehicles will double in number by 2050. Yeah. There'll be 2 billion vehicles instead yeah. of 1 billion. I personally radically disagree with that. But that doesn't matter what I think. That's bias. You That's, think it I have an opinion. Well, they're just thinking it's the same, it's business as usual, but I see with AVs, uh, autonomous vehicles, that mobility is becoming a service, not an ownership. Yeah. And it's twice, three, four times more efficient. That's true. For everybody, it saves money. Who wants to have a car yeah, in New York, right. really? You no, know? it's true. I mean, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I heard this guy who was the top guy at Uber speak, and he said the future of cars is going to be completely different. No one's going to own a car. People no. might have one for fun. With, yeah. But they're not going to be what we normally do. And you, it's like a car sharing environment where you just hit the button and an auto right. driving car shows up and takes you where you want to go. It's great. You don't have to pay insurance. You don't have to pay parking. <laughs> and they're going to be smaller and going to be electric and be quiet yeah. and they're going to have Wi-Fi and everything else you need and they're just going to go scoot around yeah. and roads are going to get smaller and more public space is going to be made available that used to be taken up by parking lots and, and highways. I mean, it's going to be transformative to the cities, but that isn't what we used. We used the IEA and the World Bank data. So what happens is you double the fleet, there goes all your savings yeah. from changing from an internal combustion engine to electric. Yeah. And so that is why uh, it's the last sector. The second sector is electrical generation, which is wind and solar for sure. Yeah. So that's renewable energy. Third was land use, which actually kind of is kissing cousins with food, yeah. food you know. But it's land use that's not productive of food tropical forests, indigenous people's land management, coastal wetlands, peatlands, etc. It's helping bring back natural lands to their original state, yeah. which helps sequester carbon. Yeah. yeah. And the fourth sector was uh, girls and women. Yeah, which I thought was <laughs> fascinating. Because you, you said that yeah. educating women girls. and family planning yeah. 
were combined among the top solutions, or number if not one, the number, number one. one. Yeah. So yeah. food in aggregate is well, top solution, number one solution. Number, yeah, yeah. And food in aggregate, you said also as is, a sector is number sector, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The girls and women is number four as a sector. Yeah. But if you combine uh, girls' education and family planning together, which they really are, because when you educate a girl, support her to get her education, she becomes a woman on her terms, more or less, yeah. depending on the situation. Yeah. But a lot more than when she's yanked out of school and married early, or put to work to put her brother through school when she's. Uh, 11 or 12 years old and that girl has an average of five plus children and we've known this for 40 years this is not new data but if she's supported to get her uh, high school education the equivalency of that she has two plus children and not only that I mean she earns more she has a better education Mm -hmm. she puts more resources into those children have Mm -hmm. a better health outcome Mm -hmm. this is the girl effect has been talked about and those children repeat their mother's behavior boy or girl doesn't make any difference Um, and so you have a very different vector in terms of growth of population and so it's a pathway to family planning but it it is the pathway of empowerment it's a very important verb I remember once at UC Santa Cruz I gave a talk just said what I just said about girls education education at the end of a talk a professor raised his hand and said yeah but how do we control population and i said lose the verb <laughs> control yeah yeah lose it yeah it's about empowerment yeah you know? and true. the fact is when women are supported they make decisions for themselves yeah. that are very very sensible decisions and, it, and it's doable i mean i i once heard the queen of jordan queen rania say Americans spend the amount they spend on pets in this country uh. could ever educate every kid on the planet, which is a stunning statistic. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. So, so there's those, 98 million girls, by the way, who are not in school, who should be. Yeah, I'm not just in any school either, but a great school. It's a school with latrines for men and women, you know, boys and girls, not just one. Yeah, um, and I mean, there's so many reasons that they are not enfranchised yeah and none of them are good yeah so you got food land use energy transportation buildings in cities buildings in cities and mater- women materials and transport yeah, yeah. seven sectors. so those are all the sectors and when you looked at the food sector it was stunning you you know you, you put some statistics in your book so it's not just a bunch of narrative stories you've got hard data and i i was struck by when you look at the food sector as a whole uh that by 2050 if all these solutions were implemented at scale you could s- reduce 321.9 gigatons mm. of carbon out of the environment it would cost 777 billion dollars but you would save 10 trillion dollars now that's a good investment yeah you know that's almost uh you know more than 10 times your money yeah and and so these are all implementation issues uh yeah. and their political will issues and their governmental issues and their there's competing political and economic and business interests that are opposing some of these ideas but when you look at that sector it's just unbelievable to me how our food sector is such a big factor and (laughs) it's something that we actually have a lot of control over because we're the consumers of food yeah we are all consumers of food on this planet and the choices we make what we put on our fork has huge impact not only for your health uh, but for your communities for the environment and clearly for climate and it's it's staggering when you think about it in that way it really is and the thing is human health uh soil agricultural uh health land health and the uh, atmospheric health are in complete alignment there's Mm -hmm. not like a diversions whatsoever yeah the healthier the soil the more carbon it sequesters and holds the healthier the soil the healthier the plants yeah. And if you eat the plants instead of eating the people or the things that are eating the plants, you're a hell of a lot healthier yeah. than that. I mean, so it's it's kind of a solution that is emblematic of almost every solution in the book, which is and which is that if we had no idea of the cause of extreme weather, if there wasn't even climatology as a science, and we yeah. were clueless yeah. as to the atmospheric. Um, 
uh, influence on global circulation models and warming, uh, we would want to do 98 of these 100 solutions yeah. because they have so many cascading beneficial yeah. effects on society, good for on everything. economy, on he- human health, on the future, on our children, yeah. on water. On, you just go right on down the line. Yeah. So it is not as though we have this problem, so therefore we should divert, you know, and s- put these things away and go do that to save our ass, you know, which is kind of the kind of rhetoric that has been around climate. Yeah. It's just the other way around. It's like, if we want to reverse global warming, let's actually save each other. Yeah. Let's actually take care of each other. Yeah. And all that comprises human need in this world. And that is how you reverse global warming. So we're destroying the environment. We're growing food that makes us sick. 60% of the food that we eat in this country is commodities, basically soybean oil, processed white flour, and high fructose corn syrup right. turned into various forms of junk food. Right. And the people who consume that are the sickest. And yet we subsidize that. So our own government policies are perpetuating this cycle. And and so we've got a very real and tangible way to think about this. And it's not just some abstract idea. The quality of the food that we grow, how we grow it, impacts our health and is destroying our health and also destroying the environment. Absolutely true. And one of the real surprising things, and maybe not so surprising when you think about it, but when we wrote uh, the book, I mean, I wrote the book with Catherine Wilkinson, and because we had to author the the book in such a way that it was readable, accessible, and that you wanted to read it, we had sixty six, seven fellows from twenty one countries who did sort of white papers, theses on each solution, and ten thousand word thesis. So we had this amazing amount of information to draw from. But end of the day, you have to tell stories. Yeah, that's ten thousand by a hundred. That's a lot of paper. <laughs> it was a lot to read. But it, so, but in regenerative agriculture, one of the things that was true with almost without exception was that truly great regenerative farmers are very conservative. I mean, they're not hippies running around with oh, no. stocks and to the, con- to the contrary. <laughs> I bet you everyone we interviewed was a Trump voter. Every one of them hit the wall. In other words. They bank, the bank came and said, Hey, we're taking your machinery or you got another year or they had two, three years of crop failure due to weather. Mm-hmm. I mean, every one of them hit the wall as a farmer. And these are second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation mm-hmm. farmers, you know, it's family land and pride and so forth. And it wasn't until then that they actually turned and looked at another way of doing it. In fact, I remember one farmer saying, Yeah saying, oh, yeah, well, this kid in a baseball cap and tennis shoes came out here and told me I should be doing this and that. And he said, well, I'll tell you something. I don't listen to kids in baseball caps and tennis shoes. Okay. And then almost without exception, every single farmer we talked to was a conservative, Republican, hardcore. Heartland. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, um, and some of them actually even were disinterested in climate. But they had hit the wall economically. And their soil had turned to dirt, their profits had turned to losses, the bank was coming to take away their machinery, mm-hmm. uh, they're going to foreclose on their land. These are, you know, multi-generational farms, you know, where there's pride, family, familial pride. And, uh, and that is when they turn to other methods. And I remember one farmer saying, you know, uh, my wife said I should talk to this kid you know, about regenerative agriculture, and he came out here with a baseball cap and tennis shoes, and he said, I don't listen to kids in baseball caps yeah. and tennis shoes. And then you see, he said, and, and like, I don't know how many years later, he said, I called that kid back. You know? yeah. <laughs> and his farm has completely transformed, yeah. and he's making so much money now that he's buying land next to him, you know, that has actually yeah. been degraded. Um and, and as, as Gay Brown said, he said, I got tired of writing, uh, signing my name on the front of the checks. He said, right. now I signed it on the back of the check. In other, yeah. words, it, in other words, it was a direct like uh, realization that where they were going was a dead end. Economically, agronomical, you know, in terms of agronomy, no question about it. In yeah. terms of yield, in terms of quality, in terms of, and they talk about my vet bills down 90, 95%. Yeah. You know, things the like that. The animals are better. Because the yeah. soil is healthy, the crops are healthy, the process is healthy, the rotation is healthy, they don't till the soil, they got rid of the tractor that the bank wanted to get because they don't need it anymore. Yeah. They, you Less know, irrigation. Oh, everything. my God. And yeah, it's yeah. interesting. You know, we, yeah. we actually don't farm. We mine. Yeah. You know, we mine the soil. We, we got lucky in this country because we had 60 million bison generating tens of feet of topsoil. Yeah. 
peeing and pooping on it, digging around, moving around, creating this massive fertile country. The tall grass prairie. And all that soil holds carbon. All that soil holds water. And what we did was we started mining the soil. Now I've heard that we may only have topsoil enough for another 30 years. Yeah, for 30, 60 years. Yeah. And the water, the same thing. Our Aglala Aquifer, the massive aquifer in the middle of the country that does most of the irrigation, we're depleting it at 1.3 trillion gallons faster every year than we're replenishing it with rainfall. That's not sustainable. I remember reading about Saudi Arabia. They said, we're going to be self-sustaining agriculture. And they have these these fossil aquifers that don't replenish because there's no rain. And they just had agriculture for five years and then they ran out of water. <laughs> And they have to buy their groceries elsewhere now. But it, you know, we're in that situation. It's just taking a little longer. And the beautiful thing about the solutions you're proposing is they're not solutions that are costing us anything. They're saving us money. They're saving health. They're saving soil. They're saving water. They're saving climate. It's it's a win 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 all yeah. the way around. Yeah. And again, when you think from a nutritional point of view, that type of industrial mining, aka farming. Um, is intensely demineralization. Yeah. And demineralizing. That is to say, and uh, I mean, the mineral content in, say, you know, apples or berries or, or, or wheat crops and so forth today are, in yeah. some cases, uh, 30, 40, 50, 80 percent less Absolutely. than they were for the same crops 100 years ago. Yeah. And so. And we're seeing health consequences. Yeah, of absolutely. Those, whether low magnesium or yeah. low selenium or. Well, yeah. zinc, yeah, and the human are. body is so extraordinarily complex. Yeah. You can't correlate directly outcomes that you're seeing today in terms of children's allergies, autism, et cetera, et cetera, with a certain mineral or this demineralization or that food or that, you know, fake food or whatever. But you got to, you step back and you yeah. look at the two and you go, our children aren't getting nourished and the mothers aren't getting nourished. And, you know, and it, it's not their fault in a sense. It's not like their intention to be that way. It is the result of the type of food industry we have and the type of agriculture that the food industry demands it be supported by. Mm -hmm. So let's dig a little bit into the way in which the food system today actually is driving climate change. We talked a little bit about things like transportation and the use of fossil fuels right. in agriculture. What are the kinds of things we should be aware of in terms of the food we eat and, and how would our choices just in that make a difference? Well, first of all, like, what's I mean, the equivalent of driving a Prius in terms of eating? Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, there's about 10 calories uh, of energy that goes into every one calorie of food. And so there's your quick calculation. And it used to be the other way around. It used to be we got 10 calories out for every calorie we put in. Mm. So there's been uh, 101, if you go 10 times 10, it's 100 times difference, 100x difference in the um, uh, energy required to produce food. And, and it goes right back to what you see. Well, it can be diesel. Uh, it can be the manufacturing of the tractors and equipment. It can be the uh, the, f the fertilizers, the mineral-based fertilizers. It can be the pesticides, the herbicides. Uh, Which all, by the way, are made from fossil fuels. Yeah. <laughs> They're petrochemicals. Right. And you're not even counting, for example, the dead zones in the Gulf and other parts of the world from the runoff of nitrous you know, oxide from the fertilizers. The nitrogen that goes into Absolutely, the Mississippi River and ends up in the Gulf of it's Mexico. so soluble. The dead zone the size of New Jersey. Jersey, right? right, it's so soluble. Nitrogen in the soil doesn't exist in that way. Yeah, you know the plants have access to it, but it's not soluble in the sense the first rainfall it's in the mm. river. And so when you you add all that up, I mean, now you also then have to go to processing, which is instead of eating whole foods, you're eating foods that are uh, processed at home, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, they're sent to where? They're sent to you know, obviously the elevators are clean, but then they're sent to companies that mass produce. You know, what white flour, hydrogenated oils, sugar, etc. Those are sent to companies that manufacture into Michael Pollan's famous food-like substances, which is mm -hmm. not really food at all. Yeah, and those things are then packaged in plastic and so forth and sent to distributors and those sent to stores and those are sent you know people drive to the store and pick those up and take them home and either eat it which is bad for them or waste it which is bad for everything so I mean this is the food system we have today yeah and people don't realize we're cutting down rainforests to grow corn and soy in ways that we'll talk about that deplete the soil further yeah contribute to climate change and then produce animals that contribute further to climate change yes to the CAFOs it's like this horrible 
I wouldn't say it's a virtuous cycle. It's a vicious cycle that leads to more and more degradation of the environment and degradation of our health. I mean, one of our solutions is women, small holders, women, small holders. And, and, uh, like, what does it have to do with climate? You know, I mean, a, and 70% of the food in, in the world is produced by small holders, which is defined by the FAO as a farm that is smaller than two hectares or five acres. And, uh, 40, 43 depends, but 43, 42% of that is women. Okay, those are the small holders. Okay, what we know is that uh, big ag, you know, the CAFOs, the GMO, soy corn, etc. That's big ag produces twenty seven percent of the world's food. Mm-hmm. And you would think, listening to them, that if we didn't support what they want to do, they would all starve. But if you actually look at what they produce, actually it's producing big pharma. Yeah. Because it's producing obesity, <laughs> diabetes, true. strokes, heart disease. It's good for business for and, the drug companies and probably and the healthcare system, and right? dementia and Alzheimer's too, because they're all interrelated, as you oh. know, because they're all inflammatory diseases. And so, so Women, okay, let's go back to women, 43% of 70 do the math and so forth. They're producing 31% of the food. They're producing more food than big ag. Yeah. And there is a solution in drawdown because if we give women, which we don't, the same tools, seeds, and support that men get, smallholders, okay, in other words, just equal it out, yeah. they outproduce men. 10 to 20 percent and if, if we yeah, you so go do, to those cultures you see the men are just sitting playing games smoking <laughs> and the women are out there working <laughs> working but they're better farmers yeah and that that the fact is then that's 200 million uh acres or hectares actually of forest that we don't have to cut down to produce food for a growing population we have all the land we need in uh in order to produce enough food for the 10.7 or 9 point Eight billion, whoever billion people can be here in twenty fifty, but not using the agricultural practices that we well, use. Well, that's the propaganda talking point. How are yeah. we going to feed the world? There's not going to be enough food for everybody. We have a growing population. Yes, we have problems with agriculture, but it's inevitable. We have yeah, to do it. I know. In fact, that is not necessarily true. And there's been some it's interesting analyses of these. One was uh, dramatically not true. Prince Charles gave a talk at Georgetown years ago, and. It, turned into a little book called The Future of Food. And he talks about how do we actually look at the truth of this? And is this an actual fact that we need these big agricultural practices to save the world? He says we don't. In fact, if we include the costs, the externalities that are not embedded in the price of the food, in the price of the food, or he calls it accounting for sustainability, it would be far more expensive to have industrial agriculture if you count the cost on health, the cost in the soil, the cost on our water depletion, the cost on climate, the cost on the environment. Those are costs which are not in a can of soda, right? And maybe it should be $100 to have a can of soda or yeah. a grass-fed, I mean, beef compared to a feedlot yeah. beef. The feedlot beef should maybe be $1,000 a pound. Yeah, right? industrial food is unaffordable. Yeah, and, and we are subsidizing it. Mm-hmm. In, in the taxpayer. In fact, we subsidize it three times. I've said this before, but we once subsidize the food mm-hmm. to be grown, wheat, corn, and soy commodities. Then those get turned into processed food, which then we subsidize for the poor mm-hmm. to almost a trillion dollars every 10 years, about 85 billion a year for food stamps. Mm-hmm. And then we pay for Medicare and Medicaid for, the illnesses. for their yeah. illnesses. Mm-hmm. On, so we're triple taxing the taxpayer for yeah. the way in which we grow, produce, and eat food. And that's why it shouldn't be a surprise, you know, people have said to us, the title of the book is, you know, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed uh, to reverse global warming. But actually, we said that because no one ever proposed a plan. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so we could say whatever we wanted. Yeah. Uh, it sounds brash, but actually it was to make a point. And the second thing is, we it's not our plan. It wasn't like our little NGO in Sausalito had a plan, listened to our plan. What we're saying is the world, in its collective wisdom, does have a plan. Yeah, these are solutions that people are actually doing, doing already. Yeah, everywhere, all right. over the world, globally, yeah. And and so that's, when you said it's hopeful, the most hopeful thing about it is that we think humanity is on the case. Mm. When you read the headlines, yeah. you get a very different sense. We don't have news, we have bad news. The good news doesn't get covered. <laughs> right, I mean, our, I mean, it's kind of like the, the, the fossil fuel team got spotted 72 points and it's a football game, okay. Yeah. But I mean, you know, they're way ahead because it's a 200 year head start. Yeah. But having a 200-year head start doesn't mean that the movement to reverse global warming isn't uh, going faster and growing faster than the movement to destroy the Earth, which is really what's happening. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there's a bit of fatalism out there. And I, yeah. I, I think, you know, fear and fatalism and denial and, uh, you know, just 
blah, blah, blah. Don't, I don't want to hear about it because it's hard to believe that we can actually do this. People, people so often think, well, the, the most important thing is the answer to the questions. And we actually, I started this saying, no, what I want to do is question the answers. Yeah. Because <laughs> I thought the answers weren't working. Yeah. Because the answers were disempowering people, disenfranchising them, and turning them off. Yeah. And I said, wait a minute, these aren't the right answers to the questions that everybody has, which is, how do I take care of myself, my family, my community, and in a way that is supportive of them and everything else, which is all living life, you know? And, and that's really what all people want to do. I've, I really feel that's true with some exceptions, you know, who are very rich, but I mean, most people on yeah. the ground want to do that. They don't know how to do that, and they've been taught how not to do it. And that's habitual right now. And so that's why Drawdown really was about possibility, which is saying we got the problem, got it, exquisite, two and a half billion data points, the fifth assessment, the sixth one's coming out next. I mean, we could have a better problem saving, you know? But now, can we just talk about solutions? Because that doesn't, repeating the problem does not solve the problem. Yeah. You know? So let's talk about the solutions. You know, the number three solution in the first food one in the list was food waste. Oh, yeah. Which people don't really think about. But, you know, 30 to 40% of all the food we eat is thrown out and ends up in landfills. Yes. Which is stunning to me. And we go, we don't have enough food to feed the world. Yeah, we do. It's in the garbage. <laughs> and and we don't like to eat ugly food. You never see a crooked carrot. You never see a misshapen potato. You never see uh, broccoli with a little brown on it i mean yeah. it's it's amazing we only want to eat perfect food and and uh you know i i went to this uh farmer's market around here in, in new york a few days ago and there was this you know beautiful display of apples and they they were all beautiful and clean and look great and pristine and then i said well do you have any organic apples and there's oh yeah they're a little bit over here and they're these kind of ugly little apples with brown and specks and little things on them and little warts and i'm like i bought those and they actually were really good so you know we we have this big food waste problem. Tell us um, why food waste is such a problem. What are the wasted resources that happen when we throw out food or food gets wasted in our society? Well, again, I mean, when we spoke earlier about the process of making food, you have to go back even further, which is you have a, a land and a tractor and diesel and so forth growing seeds actually yeah. growing seeds those seeds then are cleaned and shipped to a farmer the farmer does the same thing which is he tills the soil or she tills the till the soil then you know they what they irrigate it that's cost with pumping water um, they use herbicides they use pesticides they use you know not, you know nitrogen fertilizers that are made from petroleum and so forth and then uh, they'll harvest it you know with a you know, harvester, and then Which that harvest, will, they'll take that, and it'll go to the you know the, the grain elevator. It'll be cleaned. It'll be shipped. It'll be processed. It'll be sent to a food manufacturer. It'll be manufactured. It'll be put in plastic or cardboard or something. Usually plastic now, and it'll be shipped. You know, to distribute it goes to a, a, a retailer. The retailer, you now driving up to the thing, and you get this food. And then you take it home. So this tremendous amount of human energy and effort and fossil fuel energy has gone into this food, whatever it is. So you go home, and believe me, 40% of you take home is wasted. In America, I mean, think about it. if if so, Ford or Toyota made cars and forty percent ended up in landfills out of the factory. Well, forty like, percent of your income, forty percent oh of anything. Oh my God! Yeah, and and it, it's for several reasons. One is habitual, which is like, and it happens in restaurants. It happens everywhere. Which is, I'm full. I push it away. Mm-hmm. Um, I did it today. Somebody complimentarily gave us a bowl of harissa. And I don't need her as, uh, and they just put it there and walked away. And it was a compliment. It was for, for the chef. And they're going, I can't eat that. And so I felt really bad about it. I mean, yeah. you know, just like, oh, you know, and I didn't yeah. get them in time. And so I didn't want to say, oh, no, uh, we don't want your compliment. But I mean. This is there's a bunch of climate activists I know who like dumpster diving. Oh, yeah. Because they go in the back. And, yeah. And then some of it, they, they, it's amazing. These big food companies will actually, and grocery stores will actually police their garbage so that people don't steal their garbage. I'm like, why don't you let them take the expired this and expired that? Because it's, right. you know. But then, I mean, besides that, there's restaurants where we push the plate away. That's the polite thing to do, right? 
you know, I'm full. Thank you. That's enough. I didn't order that. I ordered too much. Sorry, I didn't think it was. Gonna and we be so give good. people too much. You know. You yeah, we stuff. give too much. And then the other thing is, we put food in the refrigerator where it goes to die. I mean, that's really what refrigerators yeah. do mostly. <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite thing is to go in the fridge. I do this with my wife. It shocks her all the time. I go and I'm, I hunt for all these different things. What looks like there's nothing in the fridge, and I yeah. make these delicious meals out of all the yeah. almost bad food. I call it bottom in the refrigerator soup. Yeah, yeah, I call it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's like W I F. Whatever is in the fridge. Yeah, whatever in there. Yeah, <laughs> but but I mean, so uh, it, it's extraordinary, you know. Then in processing on the farm itself, I mean, when we get a, uh, some romaine lettuce, all the real green leaves are left there. They just cut the the, the inner core, yeah, which is yeah. which is not so green, not so healthy. Yeah, it's true. When you when yeah. you go in your garden, you go, wow, this is what it looks like. It's yeah, a big plant. Yeah, yeah. you just taking the little court. You know, yeah, even like, broccoli. Like when I, when I grow broccoli in my backyard, I don't eat just the head. I, I eat the le- all the leaves. You can cook them. The whole thing's edible. Yeah, it's all edible. <laughs> it's amazing. I know. So we raise it, but forty percent in the United States, um, which is one hundred thirty-three billion, you know, tons of food. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. And then, but in the rest of the world, in poor countries, poor people don't waste food. But I mean, they can't afford to. Yeah. But on their farms they can't get food to market it spoils mm. they don't have yeah. cold chains they don't yeah. have the support you know to actually preserve and protect the food yeah. yeah and so they lose a lot to and they lose it to insects they lose it to mice you know they lose it to vermin they lose it uh in transport and and so and those are only the front end inputs yeah. you're talking about mm-hmm. but on the back end in the inputs when it goes into f- landfills it ferments and it breaks down and it releases methane, methane which is far more powerful <laughs> In terms of affecting climate, well, it's interesting than carbon that dioxide. food waste was the number three solution, but we didn't measure the methanogenesis from landfill food because we don't have the data. Ah, we so know it's twenty-eight to thirty-four times more powerful. Wow, than so, CO two in terms of CO two equivalents. So you didn't even include that in the calculation. So maybe it's number one. Oh, it's number one if you do that. No question about it. Unbelievable. No question about that one. So how do we fix that? Well, you know, again, we map measured and modeled. If we don't have good data, we couldn't include it. It doesn't mean the data aren't there or that the fact isn't there. It is. It's certainly well known. But if we couldn't provide, you know, ample evidence of it being measured by a third party that was credible and recognized, we couldn't include it in our models. Yeah. So, and this is an interesting point because it's not just food waste. The 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 numbers you see in drawdown are all very conservative. Yeah. By intention. So the learning rate and everything, which is how fast did the price go down on, say, an EV or solar, you know, price right. per kilowatt hour, or whatever. Um, we almost flatlined that. Yeah. I mean, we have very, very little proje- projection of costs going down mm-hmm. any further on wind, solar, EVs. Uh, that's not true. We know that's not true. We were very, very conservative on the science. So, for example, if there was uh, a... On a solar panel, it's not, you know the outcome, you know, in terms of electrons, you know, from a solar panel, it's measured, done. But on, in land use, and particularly food, there's, there's, there's scientific studies all over the map, actually, yeah. regen agriculture. And so we always did a, a sort of a median sensitivity analysis and took the low median. Yeah. Always. We mm-hmm. never took the high. And our purpose from the outset was to over promise and under was to be conservative. <laughs> over deliver and under promise. <laughs> yeah, was to be conservative. Yeah. And the reason for that is that if we we're going to get criticism, the criticism we wanted is that it's better than that, and yeah. that's exactly so far what's happened. The only criticism we've gotten on our numbers is people saying you underestimated, you undercounted. It was it's better than that. And every time that happens, we go, yeah. Which well, is impressive. It's kind of staggering how good the numbers are. Yeah, I mean, and and because if we had made one mistake on any of the numbers, and somebody said busted us and said, oh wow, you you know, you you misplaced a decimal here or whatever, that would bring the whole study, the whole model into disrepute. Yeah. And so we erred on the side of conservatives. So everything you see, you see there is actually better than that yeah. in terms of the possibility. Yeah, and, and there are companies out there that are innovating. Imperfect Produce oh. is a guy who literally goes to the farm, buys all the ugly food, yeah. and sells it direct to consumer. Watermelon water is a beautiful, hydrating, uh, low-sugar electrolyte drink that is made from misshapen or 
blanched or yeah. ugly watermelons. 800 million pounds of these watermelons were getting thrown out, and now they're made into this delicious drink. So there's there's people who are innovating around the margins on this. It's yeah, pretty- there's a lot of startups in this space now, like and even in Silicon Valley. Yeah. I don't mean Impossible Foods and the meat substitutes. I mean in terms of very, very... Uh, select niches, you know, yeah. in the food where the, there's waste and actually transferring that waste. To and it's amazing kids. what we throw out, you know, all the scraps and peels yeah. and everything. And I, I went to uh, this amazing dinner at Blue Hill where it was during a food conference for the New York Times and Dan Barber created this meal of scraps. It was all like all the garbage of that you throw in the garbage, like your potato peels and your carrot peels and all the ends of everything. Yeah, ends he, of everything. He, I mean, he made the most unbelievable gourmet meal. And it's like, wait a minute, maybe we should be making soup stock. Maybe we should be not throwing stuff away. So on an individual level, there's a lot of things we actually can do. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah, And then that sort of leads into the composting, which is another solution. You know, I think Denmark have, for 25 years has not allowed any food waste to be going into the garbage right. and you just right. can't do it and yeah. they have huge amounts of composting san francisco recently did the same thing so if you have the right political will and the leader you can actually start to make these changes absolutely and, and i by the way i have to i'm very proud in 1979 i lived in a house in i think with a bunch of friends and when i went to cornell and we won the composting prize <laughs> and i've been composting ever since and it, it makes me feel good and i put great stuff to put in my yard we got three gallons of cornell ice cream as our prize as which we ate that was before my dairy free phase but it was good <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah absolutely and and uh i mean you don't want to throw food away if possible but if it goes away and that can be the you know the peelings or the scraps you know that you actually don't eat um absolutely they they should never be uh, uh go to landfill they should be diverted and composted and if you don't put it back to the land the land doesn't you know thrive and yeah. so but the number four solution actually relates to number three too which is plant-rich diet which yeah. is very very important in other words change what you eat not yeah. just what you do with what you eat yeah. or buy and plant-rich diet is the number four solution you yeah. know which is really and know, that's different than a plant-based diet that's a plant-rich diet meaning it's what I always say with a vegan diet is you want 60 to 70 percent of your plate as vegetables yeah it's well we're, what we were saying we weren't trying to say you should be or your diet should be. We weren't saying that. What we were saying is that we should all be eating the, the um, healthful amount of protein, which is 50, 55 grams per day. And in those countries where we're growing 90, 100 grams per day, we cut that back. And in those countries where there's insufficient protein intake, we increased it yeah. so that we have a world where everybody's getting adequate protein content. Yeah. Then next, we're saying we should shift a significant amount of that protein intake to plants, from plants as opposed to you know, CAFOs, you know, meat coming from yeah. confined area feeding operations. And so those two together, produce the number four, yeah, number four solution. So both for your health, it's great to eat more plants. That's always say you should yeah. have a plant-rich diet. Yeah. But that sort of segues into the idea of Regenerate Ag. And there's there's a bunch of solutions that are all sort of related. It's, you know, the the um, conservation agriculture, there's um, managed grazing, and there's regenerative agriculture. And they're all kind of related. They are. Solutions that have to do with rethinking how we raise animals, rethinking how we... Uh, grow crops, rethinking how how we actually, um, you know, uh, protect the land. So how how can we then sort of move from from the idea of you know reducing food waste, which we need to do, to everybody should be composting? And you can, I mean, you can do that in the city. There's now compost bins you can put in your kitchen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and in fact, I live in New York City and have an apartment. And in Union Square, you can bring your garbage and compost, and they they will take it in Union Square. Now. We should have a city-wide composting program, but we don't. Right. And I feel horrible when I throw stuff in the garbage in New York. But that's the kind of stuff we can innovate around. But what about this movement around regenerative agriculture? Because people are saying, well, if you scale this up and you do um, this, this kind of grazing where you where you manage the cows and, and livestock, you can actually begin to sequester carbon by restoring soils like the buffalo did, that it could bring us down to pre-industrial levels. We don't know if that's true or not. How do you? How did you sort of come up with these solutions and and what are they? Can you kind of go through them? What's regenerative ag? What's um, managed grazing? What's conservation agriculture? And how do we combine those to really change the way we farm and grow and and have animals? Because animals are a part of this solution, right? Yeah, absolutely. Regenerative agriculture, basically, uh, it can include animals. And I think it does in most cases, but is really about, first of all, never breaking the soil, no till. 
So that's the first thing, which is you don't, when you, as soon as you break the soil, you're releasing carbon. And not only that, the, the microorganisms, soil microorganisms are dying in the face of sunshine and heat. So the soil is alive so and you're literally alive. killing it's a living it organism. when you run a till through it. Yeah, it's the most complex living organism there is, by yeah. the way. Yeah. So, <laughs> and we still don't know what's going on down there. Yeah. And so that's number one. Number two, is cover crops, which is complex cover crops, you know, not just clover or vetch, but I mean 10, 20, 25 seeds in the drill box, you know. So you're planting a real complex ecosystem that uh, is interactive with itself, that that fixes different minerals, um, that fixes nitrogen, of course, you know, in terms of leguminous crops, cover crops, you know. Yeah. And so you're bringing down nitrogen, you're putting it in the soil, but also you're creating tilth, you're creating the roots are, are breaking up the soil, creating, yeah. and you're creating greater water retention because there's more carbon in the soil, and carbon is life, and so you're producing that. And then using perennial crops or deep-rooted crops, that is to say, uh, crops the, whose roots go down instead of laterally. There's called label carbon, which is the first six inches of the soil. Mm -hmm. But actually, when you have deep rooted crops, um, they um, the carbon goes down about you know forty percent of it goes down into the roots, and that carbon is in the form of sugar. It's not like a carbon molecule, and that sugar feeds the microorganisms, the in rhizomes, the soil. and the, the yeah, the mycelia, mycelium and uh, and um, it's food. Yeah. And uh, so the plant gives the food away. Those things in turn break down the minerals, that is to say the rocks and the salt, sand or whatever in there, breaks it down and makes those minerals bioavailable to the plant, which makes the plant healthier grow. and grow. And both together then create soil that retains, you know, from three to 10 to 20 times more water. Um, and so yeah. it gives the... That's why we're floods and droughts because... Right, you can't absorb the water. You can absorb it and mm -hmm. can't keep it. But on the other hand, if a farmer has that kind the soil you do have a drought you actually have a crop that's still going to make it as opposed to being perishing right away yeah because you have no water in the soil so you create a water bank which prevents flooding at the same time you create a water bank which uh, protects crop uh, yeah and uh, the water is a value. huge issue i mean it, it, i remember being at a talk uh, by jim kim who was the head of the world bank and he said the wars of the future will be fought over water not oil and when you think about it, 5% of the Earth's surface is fresh water. 1% is in Russia under Putin, so who knows what's going to happen to that in Lake Baikal. Now he's 4% for the rest of us, and we're depleting it at mm -hmm. rapid rates that mm -hmm. are unsustainable. And, I mean, imagine if we run out of water. But look at, the, look at the good side, though, which is that global warming produces more water in the air. Uh-huh. And that's from the ocean. You get a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> no. So if you have an agricultural system that is much more retentive of water. I mean, I remember a farmer we talked to, and he pointed to some ground over there. He said, you know, we would get half an inch of rain, and it would pool. It would pool right on that uh, that land. He said, we had 13 inches, you know. Yeah, which something. is not and going said, to water. And, and we didn't pool at all. And so... So we can actually do something which is very interesting, not talked about so much, which is create an agricultural system that brings the water back. Yeah. Okay. And when you rehydrate the soil, you cool the earth. Yeah. Just like we perspire, right? And we cool the body. Well, the, this, the earth is the same. So when it's dry, which is it's getting very dry, right? Then it gets hotter. If it's full of water, you know, as, then it respires yeah, and it cools it off. Well, the other part of this whole soil story is that the soil, if it's not holding the carbon, then it's releasing in the environment. Yeah. And it, I think of the soil as sort of the rainforest of the prairies. Mm -hmm. It goes in the environment and, and it goes into the oceans. Mm -hmm. the, and then you get the death of a phytoplankton. Mm -hmm. which produce 50% of our oxygen. Mm -hmm. So not only are we going to overheat and die from the heat, we're going to actually suffocate because there's not enough oxygen for us to breathe. Yeah, and, I, and I'm and you're kind of going to where everybody else is going, which is all the things are going to go wrong. Yeah, and <laughs> but, the fix, but the fix is fixing <laughs> the soil. That's yeah. the whole thing. But, the fix is fixing the soil, but also it's fixing our relationship to the oceans, which is the oceans can be farmed in such a way that transforms 
uh, right now the CO2 is going to this carbonic acid and you know acidifying the oceans and then killing off phytoplankton and other things. And so we can start to look at the oceans as places that can be farmed. Kelp is the number one sequester, sequestration organism in the planet is kelp. Amazing. Not, ba- not bamboo, it's kelp. And yeah, I just had a kelp I mean, salad the other night. It's great. Yeah, well, when Drake, you know, went up the coast of California and and, and uh, to Oregon, Washington, the Explorer, British Columbia, the you know, Sir Francis Drake. I mean, they described the kelp beds off uh, Cascadia, which is what I call that whole area, but Cascadia, as the eighth wonder of the world. Yeah. It went out 40, 50 miles. It was just, just sea otters everywhere you couldn't you could almost pick the fish out with your hands you know it was the mo- yeah. it was a, talk about a rainforest yeah it was an oceanic rainforest and what happens that's gone today so bringing back help and bringing back oceanic life actually is actually not so difficult uh, it takes intention it takes design but there are now companies working on that. marine permaculture which is like in a sense regenerative ocean farming, yeah. you know, where you not only bring back, you know, phytoplankton, zooplankton, you know, algae, kelp, but you bring back feeder fish, forage fish, you bring back, you know, whale sharks. I mean, you it's the impressive. whole trophy cascade is yeah. brought back and you can bring it back within weeks yeah. uh, if you bring up the thermocline, if you bring up the cold waters that are now being suppressed by these heat blankets caused by global warming. Amazing. And if you produce like these... Pr- Marine permaculture has self-actuating pumps. You know, they're just actuated by the rise and fall of the water. Yeah. Tubes down to the thermocline. You bring up the cold water. You have frames there, recycled PET, whatever, so forth. And the ocean regenerates itself and sequesters more carbon per acre per hectare than any other single so source like in the world. Regenerative farming in the oceans. Exactly yeah. right. Amazing. Exactly right. And we can do that. So I want to get into a little bit of a sticky issue, um, controversial, which is the whole idea of meat. Mm-hmm. Uh, because on one hand, I think we all agree that CAFO farming, because of how the food is grown that depletes the soil and water, is industrial farming. And the CAFOs themselves, where the cows release methane and, and contribute and all the yeah. runoff, all that's just a big mess. It's a mess. No one thinks that's good. But when you start to think about using animals to restore soils, to restore water, and to dry down carbon, you know, should we be eating more meat or should we be eating the right kinds of meat that are grown in that way and and what what are the arguments for and against that because it, some people say oh yeah if we do regenerate our agriculture at scale we can have lots of meat it's not going to be as much as we have with CAFOs but it still will be able to supply the world with meat but it'll actually reverse climate change well regenerative agriculture does and doesn't have animals I mean I think the healthiest regen farms I've seen do use pulse grazing that is to say they use ruminants and and pulse grazing is just what the buffalo did you talked about earlier which is basically they graze and move graze and move graze and move graze and move and they don't stay in the same place and destroy to manage grazing and yeah. furthermore they have perennial grasses perennial grasses are deep rooted grasses and when they're bitten off so to speak by you know a cow, goat, or sheep, or whatever, uh, it stimulates root production. And so it comes back stronger, you know, and it stimulates carbon going deeper into the soil. So it is very much regenerative when you have that. If you just crop it, crop it, crop it, crop it, crop it, then that plant just gives up and yeah. dies. Okay. So, and you go to annuals then, and you plant annuals, and the annuals don't do a darn thing for the soil, frankly. So, um, but. So this idea of meat, not meat, what we know is that all grasslands in the world co-evolved with animals. They didn't just yeah. happen by right. having grass there and blowing in the wind and plant, replanting its seeds. They co-evolved the great soils and prairies and the Serengeti and all those yeah. grasslands were, even even the subarctic circle, yeah. you know, which is uh, was heavily populated by ruminants and wolves and buffaloes and Yakushan horses and the woolly mammoth and yeah. you know elk and, and 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 things that could survive minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit oh, in the winter wow, chilly. and they could survive and they ate grasses you know and and they and browse um, and produced a very healthy ecosystem they were exterminated 12,000 years ago so all the lands that we have co-evolved with animals you take the animals off the land there goes the land goodbye mm. see ya so no, that's what happened how we went from uh, 60 million bison in the 1800s to almost none, and then the Dust Bowl in the 30s. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Buffalo Common was extraordinary in its fertility and productivity. But so 
The idea of eat meat ninety, that's a personal decision. What we do know is that in order to regenerate grasslands, which hold more carbon than the forests of the world. Yeah. Uh huh. Wait, wait, say that yeah. again. <laughs> which hold more carbon than forests. So the grasslands yeah. are more powerful than the rainforest yeah. in holding carbon. Mm -hmm. Something we never talk about. No, we don't talk about that. And and so those grasslands cannot persist or be healthy or actually increase their sequestration rate of carbon unless they have animals. And not just animals sitting on them, but animals graze, Rotational managed grazing, grazing yeah. and so forth, pulse grazing. There's lots of words for it. The one thing I would say is that, you know, somebody has gone on, give a TED talk, said we can reverse global warming if we do that. That's just scientific poppycock. Yeah. Um, sorry. The Savory Institute. Uh, yeah, exactly. And Alan's a fantastic guy and brilliant man and has done amazing things and really popularizing the idea of this land animal relationship. But, but we have to be careful that there is no silver bullet because it really isn't. It's a system that caused it. Yeah. It's a system that cures it. And so we don't want to burn burden a system of saying, oh, if we do that, then this is going to yeah. happen. We're going to save our, you know, it's not true. And but what I hear you saying is that animals as part of the critical, cycle are critical. a critical component. I agree with Alan Savory. No question about and it. And that the quality of the meat's better and it promotes better health and it has less, obviously. Oh, it's very different meat. Uh, very different The quality meat. has higher omega-3 fats, more minerals, more yeah. antioxidants. Absolutely. Uh, but it doesn't mean that being vegan is right or wrong. It doesn't mean eating well, meat is right choice. or wrong. It's a moral choice. It may not be. It's so. moral. And for some people... You know, I mean, we talked about this once before. You know, people in the tropics have very long intestines. People in north and south, you know, who live in cold, inclement climates have been meat eaters for generations, have very short intestines. People with short intestines go, go vegan and actually kind of starve. People with long intestines who go all to all meat or, you know, like yeah. a keto diet don't do well at all. Yeah. Yeah. And so this idea that there's one diet fits all just no, isn't, isn't true. It's you know? really true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the best indicator is you. I would say the smartest doctor in the room is your own body. Yes. And if you listen, whether you're eating meat or not, I mean, people know. Yeah. And I think that's key. Yeah. But I think the argument that, you know, we should never eat meat because it's bad for the climate isn't the true that's, story. It, it Meat produced in industrially is bad for the climate. Yes. And that meat should be assiduously avoided. No question about and, it. And the other type might actually help. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of other interesting solutions part of this, which I thought were kind of fascinating. Things we don't really think about, like uh, how we grow rice around the world. Rice, is, other than wheat, is one of the biggest staples. And yet the way we grow rice around the world contributes to methane in the environment and these big rice patties, which look so beautiful. You take your pictures when you go on vacation, but then, you know, you're like, whoa, well, maybe actually it's not so good. So tell us about the rice cultivation story. I will, and then I'll tell you about how we are a learning organization, uh, Drawdown. It's, the research is not done. It's never done. It's ongoing. There's two methods to grow rice that um, uh, are differ from conventional rice growing, whether it's organic or non-organic, which is you take the water off the patty. Yeah, and you, you return it to an aerobic environment because when you have water on it's anaerobic in an anaerobic environment same as a food landfill uh, then you get methane production and so rice cultivation is a major source of methane in the world as a food crop and so there are two methods in order to reduce that by about 50% which have a major impact on methane emissions and those methods both increase yield and decrease the cost for the farmer. So it's kind of a win, win, win. Okay, having said that, um, last month a paper came out that said, hold on, hold on. That's all true, but when you take the water off the patty, you get increased emissions of nitrous oxide. Oh, that's not so good. <laughs> Right, so now we're looking at that and oh, saying... Oh, maybe it wasn't the best solution. Well, it is a solution, it's in there, but I just want to say we're all You're learning. learning. We're all right. learning, yeah. and, and that science didn't exist when we published and when we did our research, and we'll look at the science. It doesn't mean it's true or not true. It may be that science was done on California patties that are heavily uh, fertilized with nitrogen yeah. fertilizers, and therefore it's bioavailable and it's emitting, or does that mean the farms and... Bali, the traditional methods where you have fish in the patties, and mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what yeah, it means. Yeah. I'm just saying, is that uh, we're it, still learning. It's we're, well, that's what we intend to be. Yes. Um, so one of the things that sort of I find very fascinating is um, the whole area of how to restore farms that have been 
sort of depleted. Farmland restoration. And, and, you know, we think, oh, it's the industrial agriculturists that have done this. But often, you know, we humans are often mm -hmm. pretty destructive, you know, and even if you're a smallholder farm, you might be using practices that just are not so great. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I read this book called Sapiens, which made me a little disillusioned with the human race because I think I had this <laughs> idyllic view that we were these great people and we had this indigenous cultures that lived in harmony with the land. But the truth is we were raping and pillaging and destroying and we'd go through and ruin some place, then we'd go find some other place. Now we ran out of place, <laughs> that's the problem. And and I found fascinating in your book the the story of how we can take some of these farms that have been depleted that are now wastelands and actually restore them using more innovative practices. And this can be yeah. regenerative agri, but this can be done with small farmers all around the world who do produce most of the world's food. I mean, that was a shocking stat that, you know, if 27% of the food is produced by big ag, that means that, you know, 63% is 73. I'm not so good with math. I'm a doctor. <laughs> you know, 73% is, uh, is produced by everybody else, which are the smallholder farms. Right. right? And, and that goes to education because I think smallholders would be the first to want to farm in such a way that was less costly, more productive. And that is what Regen does. Yeah. And furthermore, there's a billion acres of land that's been abandoned. And abandoned because it's not productive, it doesn't work, it's dried out, it's been destroyed, you know. And so what we need, though, is a way for people financially to make that transition. Mm -hmm. Because that first two years is, is a money loser. And so that's why that land has been abandoned because you can't make any money on it. So why farm it? Yeah. It doesn't matter what the crop is, whether it's sheep or goats or whether it's corn or maize or, yeah. you know, soya. It doesn't make it, you know, it just, just doesn't matter. It just doesn't work financially mm. as far. So, um, we need a way to support people to make that transition. Once they make that transition, they could even pay back those loans or some of those. But so you got to have that bridge. We had the bridge and we have to recognize it. And that's true for American farmers. There's American farmers who are hitting the wall. And they can't afford to make the transition to regenerative agriculture. So there are some NGOs and people starting funds that will actually work with farmers to make that transition. But it needs to be financed, you know, yeah. the same way that many people need help on healthcare costs, right? They need help. They can't do it themselves. If they get a good healthcare pro uh, provider, then maybe they'll start being preventive in terms of, as opposed to palliative. But nevertheless, you know, yeah. Uh, that's where we are on farmlands around the world. Now, you you have been doing this for a long time, and you published the book in early 2017. And it's not just a book, it's a movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you've been then called around the world to talk to leaders about how to start to implement this. What have you seen since you published the book and are speaking about this all around the world that's given you hope? What are the kinds of solutions and things that are beginning to happen that have been catalyzed by this? Well, the, the, there's several things that were set, I set out in the beginning as sort of principles or ethos, you know, ethics, I mean, how we go about things. One was we wanted to create the conditions for self organization around drawdown as opposed yeah. to be as, so. Top down, you want to be, no, I want to be top decentralized down. and democratic. Well, yeah, because top down is too slow. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work anyway. And because you say you're right, you know, that means that someone else doesn't know and they're not right. I mean, yeah. that is not this a good way to right. communicate yeah, in the world. So number one, we don't say we're right. We don't say that. We say we think it's approximately right. And here's the data and here's our sources and help us. So number two, we're deeply collaborative. We're a small we of 220 some odd people, scientific uh, advisors, uh, advisors, uh, and then research fellows who are scholars, scientists, um, PhDs, postdocs, etc. Working together, really, to create the data points. And then a small group, me and Catherine Silver actually wrote the final copy, but that came from a copy that was written by over 60 people around the world. So we're deeply collaborative, and so we we are a small we talking to the bigger we, reflecting back to the bigger we. This is what we know. This is the, we know this, not we our little NGO in Sausalito, sure. but we the big we. Yeah. So it's important for people to understand that this is about our collective understanding and yeah. wisdom, as opposed to a small group knows this and you yeah. didn't. Okay, right. So that's the number three uh, is language. Is that we use language that is not divisive, that isn't uh, uh, sports and war metaphors. Yeah. So we don't take combat and fight. and fight, you know, and win and and you know, it's like or I was just walking up Central Park West last night and said curb your dog, and people say curb climate change, and I'm going, that's what they do in New York with dogs, <laughs> you know. It's like don't you can't curb it. 
And you just go sit on the curb. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, like, the idea that climate change is something we can curb, fight, combat, you know, crusade. I mean, all those metaphors are so stupid because climate change is a miracle. And it's yeah. the last thing in the world you'd want to fight. The problem is warming. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And warming is caused by us. And warming changes the circulation models. All climate models are about how you can't model climate. All you model is the circulation of these rivers of air in the north and southern hemispheres. Mm -hmm. And those rivers of air, you know, bring weather, bring rain, yeah. or they move and they bring drought. And so we know from the predictions that were made that as it gets warmer, the jet stream gets more wonky. And so you get more rain or you get hydrological weirdness, which is no rain. Mm -hmm. So you get drought and flood instead of the more conventional rains yeah. that were there every year. So we are very careful not to other the Using the right language. Well, not to make it other. Because making it other is the problem. Yeah. That is not the solution. To think of climate as a problem, to teach our children that climate is a disaster when they should be learning how to fall in love with it and it's a miracle. Yeah. Is, you know, and so one of the things that's come out of Drawdown yeah. is that it's taught from fourth grade all the way to graduate school. It's amazing. So the they same have a book. curriculum that actually can empower and people. Yeah, I'm going to Mega Institute this weekend to talk to teachers from fourth grade to graduate school. And historically black colleges, indigenous people, you know, so yeah. forth. And because they're using it as a template to understand what they can do in their communities, in their social political boundaries, in their states and cities, in their schools, and to teach children. So teachers are paying attention, but also governments are paying governments attention. Governments are paying right? attention. Oh, yeah. we have, And so we have drawdown cities. We have drawdown countries. We have drawdown Australia, drawdown Switzerland, drawdown Nova Scotia, drawdown mm -hmm. Toronto, drawdown. I mean, and we didn't create any of these. Okay. We didn't create them. We we're in touch with them and we talk to them and we love them and, and we see what we can do to help them. But what you're seeing is uh, drawdown organizations start up spontaneously around the world because they have the toolkit. They have a toolkit. And what you're also seeing is the model um, being uh, coded from our little kludgy way into Python, into the cloud, and then be downloaded all over the world. Yeah. So people can model India or you know, Victoria, if it's in Australia, or mm -hmm. Toronto, if it's in Canada, or Botswana, if it's a country. Yeah. So they can look and benchmark and see which of those solutions are applicable, what do they cost there, yeah. where's the source, where do you get it, how do you do it, here are the resources, here you want more, this is education, this is activation. So people around the world, they want those tools, so that we're definitely in the process of doing that, working with Penn State and MIT and Georgia Tech and University of Washington, Imperial College, College, ANU in Canberra, you know, Terry in Hyderabad, 23 universities around the world. And we cut it off because we'll work with them and then it'd be available to any university or any institution in the world. So that the model then becomes applicable to that place, uh, you know, whether it's a physical boundary or social political boundary, whatever it is, they, those people decide. And that means anybody then can go into the model and then change it, yeah. work with it, play with it. So great. And so forth. I mean, you've now taken us from being in a hopeless place to a hopeful place. I think we can do from, it. From a disempowered yeah. place to an empowered place, both on a local level and a community level, on a social level political level and even a global level with governments for those people listening they're probably wondering okay this is all great but in this set of solutions what are those things what are those actions that i can take mm. that are going to make the biggest difference so interesting is it question. composting oh so interesting that question is it, because what I, is it oh uh, because it, it, it talks you know that's the question i get you know yeah you, okay now there's a question and answer maybe tonight there'll be one so is this says, a change in your light bulb like yeah, Al Gore said or what is it you know no, they'll say well what can i do and i'll say we just met you know, like you're raising your hand, we just met. I have no idea what you can do or should do. <laughs> Only you know that. And I, I said, guess what I'm saying. No, I'm saying if I tell you what you should do, you should run. Okay, because that's bullshit. And the thing you should do is what lights you up. The thing you should do is where you get turned on. The sure. thing you should do is the thing Plant where- Plant a garden, you, whatever. Whatever it is. Yeah. And, so forth, and you can be sure if you're not doing something else, somebody else is. Yeah. I can assure you, because we know that factually. But the thing about- But people, it's really nice to know the multiple choice of, oh, these are the top 10 or 20 things. They are rated. Actually, they're, they're, like, they're ranked by- yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not going to be planting a multi-level forest in my backyard, but 
Right. I might compost my food, or I might eat more plants, or I might, right. you know, put a solar panel. So on what should I say to you? See, I wouldn't say what you should do. You know, you see the ranking, you have the book, you know, like wow, 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 mm -hmm. and so forth. Right away, you can look at waste. You know, number three, that's for easy, right? Yeah. I mean, because some of these solutions are things that require, you know, a different level of of, of action that someone as an individual can do. But a lot of these are actually things you can do yeah. and make a huge difference. And I always say the most important thing you every day is. Three times a day is decide what you put on your fork because it Absolutely. affects you. I agree. It affects your health. It's number one. The planet. Number the one. climate. Mm -hmm. It affects the political environment, the social environment. I mean, this is what my next book is going to be on. We talked about this. I yeah. think I'm going to call it the food fix as opposed to the food fight, which some people want me to call it because it's not about what's the fight. No. It's about what you can do. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And that is the number one solution because you do it three times a day at least. And or hopefully not too many times, but I mean, but you buy or consume food, and and so that is the number one solution because it's a cascading solution. It's yeah. not just not wasting food. Yeah, it's what did you eat? Where did it come from? Who made it? I mean, it, it goes way, way out yeah. and so forth. So food is definitely number one. It's Maybe. eight of the top twenty. But what we avoid doing uh, is is uh, call to action, telling people what to do, hmm. and. The interesting thing about it is that people say I was very hopeful, but I can tell you... Ten steps to reverse climate change in three weeks. Exactly. <laughs> My next book. The, the thing is that when we started it, I had no, and therefore we, had no idea whether drawdown was even possible. So we didn't go into it to prove it was possible. We didn't go in to demonstrate that it's possible. We went in and did the math. Yeah. And people say, well, it's a very hopeful book. I said, no, it's not. It's a reality project. Yeah. We are about reality, yeah. numbers, math. It's very sober. It's very interesting. And so forth. And so people say, well, it makes me very hopeful. I said, great. But that means reality makes you hopeful. Yeah. There's no rhetoric. No. It's amazing. It's, there's no rhetoric in there. There's no politics. But the story is the first solar panel yeah. went up in New York City in 1884. Yeah. yeah. Who knew? And it was yeah. just two years after Edison put up the first coal fire. I mean, plant, it's happening. You know? I mean, you know, I, I was in the Middle East recently and I met with one of the top royals and guys who runs the country and he's like yeah we we decided to invest in solar and uh, it was you know whatever it was 20 cents a kilowatt or whatever it was like not really very cost effective he says now it's one cent and now we desalinate all our water i said why don't you use oil he says this is cheaper <laughs> <laughs> i'm like wow that's unbelievable yeah yeah what's happening yeah and again it's like i think also it Absolutely, every individual should understand what their relationship is to the earth, to food, to systems, to you know, energy, everything. At the same time, there's been this overemphasis on what you can do, you, you, yeah. you, you. And it's really the only way we're going to solve this is be a we. Yeah. And to come together and collaborate. It's and true. that's what we try to model is to be a collaborative. And it's about listening. It's about sharing. It's about not being right. It's about permeability. Yeah. It's about, you know, um, I would say rigor, yeah. you know, in terms of let's make sure this is right and this works. But it's not about, you know, if you don't do this, then something bad is going to happen because that actually, right. again, puts people into a kind of a, a guilt kind of thing. Well, and you're also making a, a, a series on this. It's a Netflix or something. It's going to be running. A well, it looks like Nat Geo now Nat is, Geo, has okay. uh, surplanted Netflix and they're doing a two-hour special Amazing. on Drawdown and uh, probably uh, sponsored by AT&T it's interesting because AT&T said if they sponsor it, every ad will not be about getting a new phone, but actually what they are doing with respect to energy. Yeah. In other words, everything will be about their uh, initiatives internal to the company yeah. to reduce their carbon footprint. It's incredible. I mean, it's, it's all happening in the catalyt catalytic aspect of your book in the environment i think can't be understated i encourage everybody to go get a copy of drawdown go to drawdown.org check out what's on there i mean you almost don't need to buy the book there's so much information on the website i was like whoa he's giving away the store but it's Absolutely. good yeah we gave it away it's pretty amazing and it's beautifully think, presented and i think it became a bestseller though because the book is something people give to others yeah they they give it as a message and it's in 12 languages as of this the end yeah. of this year you know yeah. From Finnish to Arabic to Vietnamese to, you know, uh, French, Dutch and Italian, German, all those sort of things. And it's just spreading around the world. And we didn't have anybody out trying to sell the book. People are want that book for the yeah. same reason, which is they want a roadmap and the tools 
with which they, as communities, as schools, as individuals, as agency type individuals, but some individuals are city managers, some yeah. people are CEOs, some people are, and so it depends where you are, and what you can, what do, you yeah. can do. So one last question, and, yeah. and maybe we've already answered this, which is if you were king for a day, and you could change anything, and maybe you've already done the work to do what you're doing, what would it be that would have the most impact? The most impact would be to get uh, to change the get corporations out of the media. Out of the media, yeah, and not politics. Well, that is politics. Okay, <laughs> you mean Citizens United, or do you mean no, not commercials? Citizens United. That's marketing. No, no, it's that the media is actually true media. Now, right now, you have Sinclair buying every small station there is in the country, and you have. You know, the, we don't get. I mean, a free press is what you're asking a for. A free, a free true press. <laughs> now, we don't know about this, but there was something called the Fairness Doctrine. Oh yeah, which was repealed it's, under Reagan, which because the government owns the airwaves, they license the airwaves, and they changed the regulations to remove the Fairness Doctrine, which stated that all the reporting and all the information had to be fairly presented according to the facts, and that led to the rise of all these polarizing media on there where you know you don't even know what you're reading you watch fox news and you watch cnn you feel like you're in two different planets exactly and that's corporations yeah both corporations both making money but they're making money basically off the um they're neuroscientists there and they know how to actually make people addicted to that form of news it doesn't matter what's left or right yeah and uh and the thing is, we're not. You cannot have a democracy unless you're fully informed. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you vote for, unless the polity is informed in a fair and objective way, then they cannot make decisions. I have a lot of faith in human beings making good decisions if they have good information. Yeah. But without good information, and so I feel like the thing that's holding us back is that. However, at the same time, the thing that's going to push us away uh, into is that climate change is not a linear system. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rate at which CO2 is going up is very linear. It's just almost a straight line. But climate change is a complex adaptive system that uh, changes in a nonlinear way. And yeah. you have regime changes where like this year, the jet stream broke and only went down deep, deep south and baked everybody. Um, but it actually broke. It's never broken like that before. For how can a jet stream break? It's like a river stopping. Yeah. And uh, is that a regime change? Is that permanent? Or are we yeah, going to go back to the old jet yeah. stream next year? I mean, so I think you're going to have, like, you know, Mexico Beach, you know, and you had the, the, the Gulf Hurricane Michael. I mean, I think you're going to have extreme events, you know, where uh, uh, regions by region by region by region, too often the poor, unfortunately, but uh, basically get it. And they didn't get the science, they didn't get the news, they didn't get the information, they may not have the literacy that required to, to make a, uh, a decision or even the economic wherewithal to do so. But they're going to have the understanding that everybody who was a denier, everybody who was basically fobbing them off and so forth, was dead to rights wrong. Yeah. And, and that the true climate movement is about caring it's yeah. about yeah. it's about heart. It's about going back to community. It starts yeah. here and goes out, and that really the people who really want to, you know, care for all of life, not just yeah. humanity, but all living creatures and bacteria and microbes and mycelium and so forth, you know, are the ones who are at the forefront of this movement. And that's really what it's about. It's an extraordinary thing. And it's a beautiful sentiment, you know, that we're all in this together. They we really are, one, and so that's one we organism, and we're all connected. Yeah, and that's why we, we like it or not. <laughs> well, that's why we try to we avoid all polarizing language. Yeah. We vo we avoid all uh, things. I mean, the Me Too movement is about making about we made women other. Right. Okay. Fighting climate change is the same mind that made women others, making the climate other. other. You know, yeah. it's and us. <laughs> it's it's all connected, yeah. and it's us. And us. what would you do to yourself? Oh, thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thanks thank so you, much, Paul. Mark. What an amazing conversation. I hope you've all enjoyed it. You've been listening to The Doctor's Pharmacy with Dr. Mark Hyman and Paul Hawken. And if you like this podcast, please leave us a review and a comment. Share it with your friends and family on Facebook and social media. And we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy. Thanks so much, Mark. <laughs>